another glorious day when we get to share knowledge and give you maximum entertainment here at the Adventist World Radio, The Voice of Hope. This is the New Life Program brought to you by Tileno Diamo. Today, many people are involved into different affairs. There are married couples and there is also the puppy love, as they call it, which involves the youth and other young tags. Have you ever asked yourselves who has affairs and what could be the reason of having it? To find out more about this, don't miss out to listen to Pastor Kigundu when his time comes. Steve Rundu will also join us later on as he talks about covetousness by any other name. Fantastic music also in store for you. So keep it the voice of hope. Behold what the Lord's bound is not, the Father hath bestowed. O sinners, those that we should be, now call the sons of God. Let us now listen to Pastor Kigundu Ndwiga as he ministers unto us on the family life segment about who has affairs and why.
Dear listener, we want to welcome you to our special program, The Abundant Life, which is based on John 10, verse 10, where Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And I believe that this abundant life also extends to our family life. The topic today is who has affairs and why. Dear listener, there are some basic questions that most people have about affairs. One question is, who has affairs? Second question is, why do people have affairs? Third question, how prevalent are affairs? So, who has affairs? You see, we tend to think that only bad people have affairs, and only people in bad relationships have affairs. But dear listen, I want to tell you, no one is immune from an affair. Monogamy is something most people say they believe in and they want for themselves. Actually, every survey ever done on this question shows a high percentage of people think monogamy is important to marriage and that affairs are wrong. But a belief in monogamy as an ideal doesn't prevent large numbers of people from having extramarital affairs. Most people don't intend to have an affair, and most people don't think it will happen to them. But unfortunately, it does. So the bottom line, dear listener, is that no one is immune from having affairs. They happen to all kinds of people in all walks of life. So now the quest- second question I want us to look at is why do people have affairs? The first question most people ask when they learn of their partner's affair is why. Again, the why questions. And the answers they come up with are usually based on personal blame. They blame themselves. They blame their partner. They blame their relationship or the third party. They see it strictly as a personal problem, a personal failure of the people involved. These unfortunately, is a very simple explanation for a very complex question. Usually, dear listener, there are three different kinds of forces that are working together, driving people towards affairs. First ones are forces within the individual that pull them towards affairs. Forces within the individual that push them towards affairs and their societal factors. Forces within the individual that pull them towards their affairs, these include attraction, you no, know, for sex, uh, companionship, uh, admiration, and power. There is a concept of novelty, something new, excitement, uh, risk, uh, ch- or challenge. There is curiosity or enhanced self-image or falling in love. And forces within the individual that push them towards their affairs are desire to escape or find relief from a painful relationship. Well, there is the issue of boredom where the marriage goes in the rut. There is the desire to fill gaps in an existing relationship. There is the desire to punish one's partner. There is the need to prove one's attractiveness or worth. And there is the desire for attention. What about uh, societal factors? You see, affairs are glamorized in movies, uh, soap operas, romance novels, and TV shows of all kinds. Public disclosure of public figures having affairs is headline news because we are fascinated and titillated by hearing of others' affairs. You see, people are bombarded with images of women as sex objects in advertising and marketing campaigns. Over and over, the message to men is that the good life includes a parade of sexy women in their lives. So women inadvertently, sorry, women unfortunately buy into this image and strive to achieve it. You see, the lack of good sex education and the existence of sexual taboos combine to make it difficult for most partners to talk honestly about sex. As teenagers, we get conditioned in deception when it comes to sex, engaging in sexual activities while hiding it from our parents. 
The code of secrecy is a major factor in affairs because it provides protection for the person having affairs and leads them to believe they wouldn't get caught. So, dear listener, the bottom line is this. There is no single one reason a person has an affair. There are usually many reasons, including those of the forces that pull them towards affairs, some of the forces that push them towards affairs, combined with the influence of the general factors in society that contribute to affairs. So, the last question I want us to look at today, dear listener, is how prevalent are affairs? Conservative estimates are that 60% of men and 40% of women will have an extramarital affair. These figures are even more significant when we consider the total number of marriages involved, since it's unlikely that all the men and women having affairs happen to be married to each other. Even if half of the women having affairs, or that is 20%, are married to men not included in the 60% having affairs, then at least one partner will have an affair in approximately 80% of all marriages. Studies dealing exclusively with men indicate a continuous increase in the number of men having extramarital affairs. The increase for women having affairs has been even more significant. And while there are slight differences in the estimates based on clinical studies and questionnaires, the bottom line is compelling in showing an extremely high and unfortunately rising incident of extramarital affairs. So why does it help to know about the prevalence of premarital affairs? For the person who knows that their spouse has had an affair and is still trying to understand why, acknowledging the prevalence of affairs in our society can help them put it in a more realistic perspective. Understanding just how many others face the same situation, regardless of who they are or who they are married to, can help break the sense of being so alone, so isolated, or singled out for this experience. This knowledge can help overcome the feeling of why me. People who have not yet faced this issue, either in their own lives or with their friends or family, would do well to start with a realistic picture of the frequency of affairs in society as a whole. It's not that the sheer frequency means it will happen to any specific person, but it does say a lot about the kind of support to expect from society for remaining monogamous versus having affairs. We need to make a commitment to face the reality of affairs and address the issues in a more responsible way, both individually and as a society. Dear listener, this is the bottom line. Most of us expected monogamy to be a normal part of marriage or any committed relationship. Unfortunately, the reality is that monogamy is not the norm. Our fallen human nature pulls us away from monogamy, which is God's ideal for us. On our own, dear listener, we cannot make it. But like Paul said, we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Dear listener, as we conclude this broadcast, may we trust and depend on God's grace to enable us to be faithful to our spouses as long as we are married, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. In case you have just joined us, thank you for tuning in. This is the Adventist World Radio, the voice of hope. I am your host, Chileno Diambo. Give us your views, comments, and suggestions about this program by writing to the producer, Adventist World Radio, P.O. Box 42276, code 00100, Nairobi, Kenya. We are also online at awrnairobi at eau.com. 
www.adventist.org Do not wait until some need of greatness you may do Do not wait to shed your light of hope To the many duties ever near you now be true Right in the corner where you are Right in the corner where you are Right in the corner where you are Someone far from love you may guide across the bar Right in the corner where you Just a close but cloud skies that you may have to be. Let no narrow self your way depart. Though into another Lord may fall your song of cheer. Bright in the corner where you are. Bright in the corner where you are. Bright in the Coveting is the act of desiring something wrongfully. A good example is when one admires somebody's life. Through that, one has already committed covetousness. Steve Rundu is here to expound more on that. Be educated. Covetousness by any other name. Our key text this day comes from the book of Joshua, chapter 6, verses 17, all the way to 20. And I will read, The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall be spared, because she hid the spies we sent. But keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise you will make the camp of Israel liable in destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold are the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. Consumerism, a recently coined word for a recent widespread development of the human sin, is in reality only a new manifestation of an age-old human sin, covetousness or greed. Pope John Paul II, in an encyclical letter, made the following observations. In earlier stages of development, men always lived under the weight of necessity. His needs were few and were determined to a degree by the objective structures of his physical makeup. Economic activities was directed towards satisfying these needs. It is clear that but also today the problem is not only one of supplying people with sufficient quantity of goods, but also of responding to a demand for quality. The quality of the goods to be produced and consumed, the quality of the services to be enjoyed, the quality of the environment and of life in general. To call for an existence which is qualitatively more satisfying is on of itself legitimate, 
but one cannot fail to draw attention to the new responsibilities and dangers connected with this phase of history. A given culture reveals its overall understanding of life through the choices it makes in production and consumption. It is here that the phenomenon of consumerism arises. In singling out new needs and new means to meet them, one must be guided by a comprehensive picture of man which respects all the dimensions of his being and which subordinates his material and instinctive dimensions to his interior and spiritual ones. If on the contrary, a direct appeal is made to his instincts while ignoring in various ways the reality of the person as an intelligent and free, then the consumer attitudes and lifestyles can be created which are objectively improper and other often damaging to his physical and spiritual health. It is not wrong to want to live better, but what is wrong is a style of life which is presumed to be better when it is directed towards having rather than being, and which wants to have more, not in order to be more, but in order to spend life in enjoyment as an end in itself. It is therefore necessary to create lifestyles in which the quest for truth, beauty, goodness and communion with others for the sake of common growth are the factors which determine consumer choices, savings and investments. In this regard, it is not matter of the duty of charity alone, that is, the duty to give from one's abundance and sometimes even out of one's needs in order to provide what is essential for the life of a poor person. I am referring to the fact that even the decision to invest in one place rather than the other in one productive sector than, rather than the other is always a moral and cultural choice. What drives our decisions regarding what and how much to consume, not just food but everything that you will buy or obtain? How much of your consumption is focused on satisfying your own needs and wants, your families and others? How does your level and type of consumption affect the environment, your ability to care for others, your health, both physical and mental? What are some ways in which you could make better choices in your consumption? Let us pray. Lord God, you are the creator and maker of everything. Help me to steward all that you have given me in a proper manner and help me to be directed by you and your Holy Spirit in all my decisions regarding my consumption, for I have prayed all these things, trusting and believing in the mighty name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We have come to the end of today's New Life program. It has been great having your company. Stay tuned to the Adventist World Radio for other great items coming your way. We would also like to get your views, comments, and suggestions regarding this program. Do so by sending them to the producer, Adventist World Radio, P.O. Box 42276, code 00100, Nairobi, Kenya. Our email address is lwrnairobi at eau.adventist.com. Org. From me, Tillian Odiambo, and the rest of the New Life production team, we say thank you and have a blessed day. All things are ready, come to the feast, come for the table now is spread. If our mission, he will recall, and thou shalt be richly fed. He
sins are ready. Come to the feast, live every day and what is right. Come feast upon the love of God and drink everlasting life. In the invitation, invitation, come For whosoever we hold what the Lord's bound is not the Father hath bestowed. All sinners lost that we should be now called the sons of God. Be Yeah.